Leviticus 25, 23 through 28. Leviticus is basically a, a Leviticus would be a, be a bunch of rules and commands about what to do, what not to do. And the priestly order of Levites in the Bible many years ago. I'm going to start kind of in the middle of something here, but it'll make a little more sense later on. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of that land. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. If, however, there is no one to redeem it for them, but later on they prosper and acquire sufficient means to redeem it themselves, they are determined the value, value for the years since they sold it and refund the balance to the one to whom they sold it. They can go back to their own property. But if they do not acquire the means to repay, what was sold will remain in possession of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. It will be returned to the Jubilee and they can go back to their property. I know you're asking me, what in the world am I reading? <laughs> what is the year of Jubilee? What has this got to do with anything? All right, well, we will find out. First of all, the year of Jubilee is a time in Israel that, I say it's seven, seven times seven? I think that's right. 40, and every 49 years is a year of Jubilee. Basically when you were supposed to forgive other people their uh, debts and whatnot. All right, here's a story. If you want to follow along, it's basically the story of Ruth. The book of Ruth is a story. If you want to turn there, that's fine. If not, I'll just tell you the story. In the book of Ruth, it says, a long time ago, during the time when the judges ruled, there was a famine, no food. There was a famine in the land, and a man named Imelech left the town of Bethlehem. Hey, Bethlehem, we know that place. He and his wife and his two sons moved to the country of Moab. Later, Naomi's husband, Imelech, died. So Imelech died. So Naomi and her two sons were left. Her sons married women from the country of Moab. One wife's name was Orpah, and the other's wife's name was Ruth. That's who the book is written about. They lived in Moab about 10 years. And then Naomi's sons died, both of them. So now Naomi was left alone with her husband and her two sons. She was left without her husband and her two sons. So first of all, we want to see that a long time ago, wasn't like it is today where we have a lot of different kind of means and ways. When the husband or the father or the sons passed away, it was a great hardship on the females left in the family. While Naomi was in the country of Moab, she heard, she heard that the Lord had helped his people. He had given food to his people in Judah. So Naomi decided to leave the hill country of Moab and go back home. So she returned home. Her daughter-in-laws also decided to go with her. They left the place where they had been living and started walking back to the land of Judah. Now they're walking. I can get to take a taxi or a bus. I mean, no means. I mean, at this point in time, you're talking about starvation, famine in the land. I mean, these, you know, they're, they're in a hard way here. In verse 8, Naomi told her daughters in law, Each of you should go back home to, to your family, to your mother. You've been very kind to me and my sons who have now passed away. So I pray that the Lord will be just as kind to you. I pray that the Lord will help each of you find a husband and a good home. And Naomi kissed her daughters-in-law, and then they all wept and started crying. The daughter said, but we want to come with you. We want to go to your family, back to your home. Naomi said, no, daughters, you go back to your own homes. Why should you go with me? I can't have any more sons to be your husbands. Go back home. I'm too old to even have a new husband. Here she, she's going, she's going through some stuff now, right? So I'm just, I'm just, I'm all about, about to give up here. You go, go save yourselves, in other words. Even if I thought I could be married again, I couldn't help you. If I just became pregnant tonight and had two sons, you'd have to wait until they grew to become men before you could marry them. I can't make you wait that long for husbands. That would make me very sad. And I'm already sad enough. The Lord has done so many things to me. Oh, what do we sing about? Blessed be your name. Give and you take away. Naomi's having a tough time. So they all cried and Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye. But Ruth hugged her and stayed. One left, one stayed. Naomi said, well, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her own people. You should do the same. But Ruth said, 
Don't force me to leave you. Don't force me to go back to my own people. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you sleep, I will sleep. Your people will be my people. You may have seen that. That's a, that's a very quoted line on lots of plaques. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you will die, I will die. And that's where I'll be buried. I ask the Lord to punish me if I don't keep this promise. Only death is going to separate us. All right. So Ruth is very committed to Naomi. Naomi saw that Ruth wanted very much to go with her. So she stopped arguing with her. Naomi and Ruth traveled together until they came to the town of Bethlehem. My, how things come back around. When the two women entered Bethlehem, all the people were very excited. They said, is this Naomi? She's returned home. Naomi told the people, Naomi's kind, of, Naomi's kind of down. She turned home, she's kind of down. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mar Mara. Use this name because God all powerful has made my life very sad. She's, she's really down the dumps. I had everything I wanted when I left, but now the Lord brings me home with nothing. Have you ever returned back home with nothing? The Lord has made me sad, so why should you call me happy? God all powerful has given me so much trouble to me. So Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, came back from the hill country of Moab. These two women came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So they came at harvest time. Enter Boaz. Here you go. I'm not sure why, why more people don't name their son Boaz. I know it's, a, it's an odd name, but you'll understand why it would be a good thing. Good old Boaz. There's a rich man named Boaz living in Bethlehem. Boaz was one of Naomi's close relatives from Emelech's family, actually. One day, Ruth said, Naomi, I think I'm going to go to the fields. And maybe I can find someone there who will be kind to me and let me gather the grain that they leave in their field. It was a common thing to do when the workers would go out in the grain field. They would kind of go through it pretty quickly. And there would always be a little bit left on the ground. Leftovers, I guess you'd say. So they were, they were in a hard way here. And so she said, fine, you know, go ahead. You can try that. So Ruth went to the fields. She followed the workers who were cutting the grain and gathered the grain that was left. It happened that part of the field belonged to Boaz, the man from Emelech's family. So there you go. We're starting already. Look how God has worked. I'm just going to go to a field. I'm going to do this. She ended up being in Boaz's field. Didn't know it at the time. Later, Boaz came to the field from Bethlehem. He greeted his workers and he said, Lord be with you. And the workers answered, May the Lord bless you. This will give us insight into Boaz's character. He was a God follower. Boaz spoke to his servant who was in charge of the workers and said, Well, who's, who's that girl out there in the field? The servant answered, She's the Moabite woman who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. She came early this morning and she asked me if she could just follow the workers around and gather grain that was left on the ground. Boaz said to Ruth, listen, stay here in my field to gather grain for yourself. There's no need for you to go to any other field. You just continue following behind my workers. Watch to see which fields they go out into to cut the grain and you, you follow them. I've, young, I've warned uh, people not to bother you. When you're thirsty, go and drink from the same water jug that my men drink from. And Ruth bowed very low to the ground. She said to Boaz, I'm a foreigner, so I'm surprised that you even noticed me. Boaz answered her and he said, I know all about the help that you've given to your mother-in-law, Naomi. He had already heard all the good things that she had done. You know what? A lot of times you'll do things in life you don't realize anybody's paying attention. But people see what you're doing. He says, I know you helped her even after her husband died. And I know that you left your father and your mother in your own country and came here to this country. You didn't know anybody from this country, but you came here with Naomi. And Boaz says, the Lord will reward you for all the good things you've done. The Lord, the God of Israel, will pay you in full. You have come to him for safety and he will protect you. Boaz is wise, isn't he? Then Ruth said, well, I hope I can continue to please you. You're very kind. I'm only a servant. I'm not even one of your own servants, but you, what you have said is kind words to me. It's helped, it's helped comfort me. At mealtime, Boaz told Ruth, come and eat some of our bread. Here, dip your bread in our, in our wine. 
So Ruth sat down with the workers. Boaz gave her some roasted grain. Ruth ate until she was full. And there was even some food left. And then she got it and went back to work. She went back to work. Boaz told his servants, let Ruth gather even around the piles of grain. Don't stop her. And let's just make her work even easier by dropping some full heads of grain for her. Let her gather that grain and don't tell her to stop. I like this right here already. It's a picture of somebody taking care of somebody else without making it all showy. And also he wanted to, to um, propagate the fact that she was a hard worker and let her do the work. Ruth worked in the field until evening. Then she separated the grain from the chaff. There's about one half bushel of barley. Ruth carried the grain into town to show her mother-in-law that she, what she had all gathered. She also gave her the food that was left from lunch. Leftovers. There's another sign of leftovers in the Bible. Her mother-in-law said, where did you get all this grain? Where, where did this come from? Bless the man who noticed you. Then Ruth told her that she had worked with. She said, the man I worked with is named Boaz. What? Naomi told her daughter-in-law, the Lord bless him. He's continued showing his kindness to the living as well as the dead. And Naomi told her daughter-in-law, Boaz actually is one of our relatives. He is one of our protectors. Ruth said, Boaz told me to come back and continue working. He said, I should work closely with his servants till the harvest is finished. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, it's good for her to continue working with his women servants. If you work in another field, some people might hurt you, but not understand. So Ruth continued working closely with the servants of Boaz. And she continued working to the end of the harvest. And Ruth continued living with her mother-in-law. Okay, so now we have part two of the story. We got Boaz, and now we have Ruth working. Now we have the threshing floor, so to speak. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said her daughter, may I should find a husband and a good home for you. Now I kind of get a little comfortable now. That's going to be good for you. Boaz, a close relative, you work with his servants. And tonight he'll be working at the threshing floor. Go wash yourself and get dressed. Put on a nice dress. Go down to the threshing floor. But don't let Boaz see you until he's finished eating his dinner. After he eats, he'll lie down to rest. Watch him so you'll know where he lies down. Go there. Lift the cover off his feet. What? Lie down there with Boaz. He'll tell you what you should do about marriage. Ruth answered, I'll do what you say. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor, did everything her mother-in-law said to do. After eating and drinking, Boaz was very satisfied. He went to lie down in the pile of grain. Then Ruth went to him very quietly, lifted the cover from his feet, and lay down by his feet. About midnight, Boaz rolled over to sleep and woke up. He was very surprised, as I would be too. There was a woman laying at his feet. Boaz said, who are you? She said, I am Ruth. I'm actually your servant girl. You are my protector, she said. Boaz said, may the Lord bless you. You have been very kind to me. Your kindness to me is greater than the kindness you showed Naomi. You could have looked for a young man to marry, rich or poor, but you did not. Now don't be afraid. I will do what you ask. All the people in our town know that you're a good woman. And it's true that I'm a close relative. But there is a man that is a closer relative to you than I am. You stay here tonight and in the morning we'll see if he'll help you. If he decides to help you, that is fine. But if he refuses to help, I promise, as surely as the Lord lives, I will marry you and buy back Imelech's land for you. So you stay here till morning. All right, here's some context. Is that protocol, like what we read in Leviticus, somebody else is supposed to be the protector first. Somebody else is next in line to make this deal. So Ruth lay near Boaz's feet until morning. She got up while it was dark, before it was light enough for people to recognize her. Boaz said to her, well, keep it a secret that you came here to me last night. Just bring me your coat and hold it open. Ruth held her coat open. Boaz measured out a bushel of barley, gave it to her, wrapped it in her coat, put it on her back, and she went to the city to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth went in telling Naomi everything that had happened and said, Boaz gave this as a gift for you. And I must not go home without bringing a gift. Boaz and Naomi's close relative coming up. Coming down the home stretch. Boaz went to the place where the people gathered near the city gates. This is like he went to court, so to speak. He sat there until the close relative he had told Ruth about passed by. Boaz called him, called him and said, Come sit here, friend. 
Boaz gathered 10 of the elders of the city, witnesses, and said, sit here. And so they sat down. Boaz spoke to Naomi's close relative, and he said, Naomi came back from the hill country, Moab. She wants to sell the land that belonged to her relative. I decided to tell you about this in front of all the people living here, in front of all the elders, that I want to pay the widow for the land and keep it in the family and then pay her for it. If you don't want to buy the land, tell me, because I'm the next one in line that has the right to buy it. If you don't buy the land from her, I will. Then Boaz said, if you buy the land from her, you must also marry the dead woman's wife, Ruth, the Moabite woman. Then the first child will give the land and it will stay in the dead man's family. These are just re repeating the rules. The close relative said, I can't buy the land. If I do, I might lose my own land. I can't, can't do it. I can't afford it. You buy the land. And this is funny. He gave Boaz something to show that he was serious. You know what he gave me? He showed him was serious. He didn't get a piece of paper. didn't get a contract. He gave me a shoe. <laughs> I like that. Now, apparently, this was a, a, a tradition that when you bind a contract, especially a financial contract, you give the other person your other sandal. Now, I don't know if they kept the sandal. I'm not sure what happened after that point. I know that's a tradition. And he says, you buy the land. He took off his sandal and he gave it to Boaz. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you're witness here today. I'm buying this land. I'm buying everything from Naomi that belonged to Imelech. And I'm going to take Ruth to be my wife. And the dead man's property will continue to belong to his family. And the elders and the people said, we are all witness to this. And may the Lord bless this woman who is coming into your home to be like Rachel and Leah. They are the ones who had many children to make the people of Israel strong. May you become powerful in the tribe and famous in Bethlehem. May the Lord bless you with many children through your youth. May your family be great like the family of Perez. This is just talking about history of Israel. And so, end of story here. Here's the, here's the happy every after part. Boaz married Ruth. The Lord allowed Ruth to become pregnant and she had a son. The woman there said to me, praise the Lord who gave you this child. May you become famous in Israel. He will make you alive again and care for you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law made it happen because she bore this child for us all. She loves you and she is better for you than seven sons. Naomi took the boy, held him in her arms and cared for him. The neighbors gave the boy his name. These women said, Naomi has a son now. And they named him Obed. They named him Obed. And here's where the story gets very interesting. The last sentence of the story says, Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. What an incredible thing. Look at all the situations and all the circumstances that had to work out just right. God poured into people hope when they were hopeless. God poured into people direction when they were directionless. This is called story of the kinsman redeemer. If you've ever heard that term before, but what we read earlier in Leviticus talked about all the rules and things that have to happen when you pay money for land. And also the church is many times called the bride of Christ. It's called the bride price. When you would pay, it's kind of like a dowry. And if, if you've had anybody get married lately, you know that weddings and payments, kind of weddings are very expensive. The bride price, so to speak. And in this situation, what we have seen, this is a great analogy and allegory for God's love for us. We are all kinsmen with the children of God. And this is what we have in common as a church. People say, well, what do you do at Bethlehem? What is it that people have in common there? And the number one thing that we have in common is that we've all been redeemed by the kinsman redeemer. And many times that can be told with a story. So the things that we have learned so far, and I'll finish with this, is what the church is about. The church, of course, started with Peter. When Jesus told Peter that he was the rock. And from that point on, the church became the rock of faith. And he said, there are things that you're going to have to endure as a church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. There are things you're supposed to do. Baptize, Lord's Supper, obey commands, and even hard stuff like excommunicate people from the church. There are times when we have to search out what God is going to do for us in our lives. We don't know the future. 
But if we just follow God's commands, he will work out a way. This is what we have in common as church people. Sometimes people have different things in common. You know, you can go to a club, you go to an organization, you'll have things in common. But this is not really what we propose as the central theme of being in a church. A church is, our central theme is, we've all been redeemed. And through this story, through the lineage, through the line, Jesus Christ eventually came. That's why it was important for him to be called from the house of David. And as the Bible speaks very clearly, especially we'll talk about at Christmas time, about how Jesus came from the house of David. And so this is what we have as a church family. As the, many times as people, we may not get along. Anytime we get people together, there's going to be disgruntled things happen. That's just human nature. But we have to understand that we're all common in one nature, and that is that we're all uh, redeemed through our kinsman redeemer, which is Jesus.